This is Rob Tubb for Boxing Social. Delighted to be joined, as always, by Shane McGuigan. We're down at McGuigan's gym in Wandsworth. How are you doing, Shane? Good, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well. Tired, hanging in there. Got a few days off, so I'm looking forward to that. I can see you're tired because you were texting me at fucking 5am on uh, Sunday morning. <laughs> um, nah, I know. I know what, you, you know what you're down here to ask me about, so let's go. <laughs> Talk to me about James the Girl versus Chris Eubank Jr. That, incidentally, is what I was messaging Shane about at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, I thought it wasn't the exciting fight that, that was talked about. I didn't think De Gale brought his um, brought his old self to, to the table. You know, obviously, I thought it was a very one-sided fight. I thought that um, Eubank was very patient. Um, you know, did he use his jab? Was his feet better? You know, was his timing any better? Not really. I just thought, you know, um, he... he, he, he he was a little bit more patient, and he and he let um, he let De Gale fall in a lot, and he was just used his his athleticism and his speed to beat him to the punch. Um, I thought, you know, he he had him he had him hurt a lot of times, and and didn't quite look as conditioned as he was in in previous years. Um, and he could have, you know, if he'd have been a little bit more fresher, which you know, one of the things about Eubank Eubank Junior was that he was at ferocious work rate. If he'd have kept that um, sort of conditioning, um, I thought he could have obviously got De Gale out of there. But um, credit to De Gale for staying in there, even even though he was a shell of a shell of his former self. Now you just mentioned that. I think general consensus is that James De Gale has or had slipped an awful lot from his best. How far do you think he is from a prime James De Gale? Um, I. Th- I, it's hard to put it into into context. I mean, you know, you you got to think um, against you know the Lucien Boutes and the um, uh, Andre Durrells of this world. That was probably his best. Um, but you know, you have to you have to be able to age gracefully. You know, you got the Bernard Hopkins of this world that was a, a shell of himself, but he was still winning world titles. And um, you know, the same with Floyd Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, he was able to age gracefully, but I think you know De Gale's sort of um, reflexes, and you know he was a, he was a reflex fighter. He was he had good timing. Um, he just looked a bit drawn. He looked like he would spent too long um, making the twelve stone limit. You know he's a, he's always been pretty big for the weight. Him and George were big big super middleweight. So you know that that sort of stuff. As you as you get older. Um, you know, your metabolism slows down. You have to do that a little bit more in camp to try and to try and get the weight down. But then again, you don't need to spar quite as much. You, so the best thing for bringing weight down is sparring. It's just it's hard to it's hard to find what works. Um, you know, when when you get a little bit when you when you're sort of slipping. So um, I don't think it's anything to do with his conditioning with Jimmy Jimmy McDonald or or anything. I just think it's a natural decline that, that he's that he's had. Um, you know, Badu Jack fight took a lot out of him, and and if you really analyse his performances since then, it's it, he's he's not even looked remotely close. So, you know, you you could say he's 50, 60 percent of what he was um, pre pre Badu Jack. What did you make conversely of Chris Eubank Jr.'s performance compared to the Chris Eubank Jr. that boxed George Groves, who obviously you worked with um, 12 months ago? Now I'm going to go out <laughs> and sound um, like I'm not being negative towards his performance. I think the the Chris Eubank Jr. that boxed George Groves um, would have done exactly the same to that De Gale. He, he probably would have even stopped him. He looked a little bit more conditioned. Um, you know, he had better instructions in the corner in the sense like, you know, be patient. But if he'd have been patient with George Groves, he'd have got even more be even even more widely beaten because, you know, George had a had a phenomenal jab. Did he jab more you know, he jabbed the body quite well early on, uh, which sort of stopped uh, De Gale's movement. But um, you know, you think about you think about when you start jab- trying to find the jabs of the head. You know, someone like James De Gale's got good slips. He slips you know, narrowly as well. So you got to start jabbing the body. Um, and I think his timing was in a lot more with his right hand. But then again, how much is that due to James De Gale being a lot more hittable than George Groves? Um, you know, he looked he looked gassed at times. Um, Eubank Jr. looked like he he um, 
when he went tried to go through the gears he, he was you know expelling a lot of energy something that he's always spent a lot of time in camp doing because he obviously spars loads of rounds they probably brought the sparring down and with that that might have brought his conditioning down a little bit more but the quality of sparring might have been up which um, means that you know his timing was in a little bit more so I don't think it was a, a marked improved um, Eubank Jr. I think uh, it was a, a massively declined uh, James De Gale. And also, you know, you've got to give credit to George Gross for the, the way he was able to negate and, and, and shut him down. As I said a, a good few weeks uh, before the fight with you when we, when we did the, the interview at the gym, you know, if you look at his Achilles heel, Eubank Jr. It is, it is someone that's heavy-handed, someone that's patient and heavy-handed and can, and can be physical in close because as soon as you can tie him up and be physical in close and, and, and gain ground, you, know, you, can you can just stop him working. And you know, James DeGale didn't have, to have those attributes. Would he have ever had those attributes? We don't know. Um, but George Gross definitely did and that showed why it was such a, such a wide points win for, for Team Gross. Now you've faced Chris Eubank Jr. You've also faced Callum Smith. Do you think Chris Eubank Jr.'s win has any bearing on the the landscape at 168 pounds? Would you would you favour him, or is the Callum Smith fight a bridge too far for Chris Eubank Jr.? Well, you got. I mean, you know, with I don't know what's going on with the WBO. I think Ramirez was supposedly moving up, and then he's come out and said that he's not vacated yet. And um, I personally, if I was Eubank Jr. Um, and Eubank Senior navigating his career I would go for the for the Saunders fight straight away um, you know once he once he beats uh, once he wins the vacant title I think that'd be a great fight for him to to rematch um, Callum Smith is a he's a you know he's, he's a he's a, a, in the league of his own at the moment um, as I said you know in previous interviews I think he's the number one in the division but with the landscape changing you've got Caleb Plant you know He's he's definitely um, a, a winnable fight for Eubank Jr. You know, I've seen George spar him. I've seen him up close. He's very slick, but a combination puncher is going to be his, his nemesis, and that is someone like Chris Eubank Jr. So um, I would target the IBF with Caleb Plant or the the winner of the WBO, and I'd say well well clear for now against um, Callum Smith. I think Jr. still needs to fill into the weight a little bit more. There's no point him really moving back down to 160 pounds. You know, the big fights out there, now that Saunders has moved up, the big fights domestically are at 168 and, and they're, they're domestically but they're on the world scene. So yeah, you've, got, you've got Jacobs and Canelo fighting for, for, the, um, for the middleweight uh, title and I think you know, there's the Golovkins, is, he's pretty much got one or two more fights than him. He won't want to fight someone like Eubank Jr. So I, I would personally stay at 168 and, and stay clear of Callum Smith for now, build more confidence, build more momentum. And then, uh, and then maybe try and challenge him later on down the line. Now, something that was very interesting came out in one of the interviews, not mine, um, from Chris Eubank Sr. I know you've seen this, um, where he suggested that you should potentially train Chris Eubank Jr. This is something that we actually spoke about quite off the cuff a couple of weeks ago. But him saying that is interesting to me. Is it ever something that you'd consider? Was that on the, the Rival channel? That was on IFL TV. Was Shout it? out IFL TV. Yeah, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. I saw the headline, but I didn't see the interview. Um, but I heard, yeah, he, he mentioned something. So, um, uh, someone's leaning on that. Uh, it is something that I would consider. You know, if it, I wouldn't move. I wouldn't start locating down to Brighton. It would, you know, I have my way of training fighters, and I've got my priorities. I've got Josh Taylor in the gym. I've got Luke Campbell. Um, you know, in the, in the gym as well. Those two, two are about to fight for world titles. Um, you've got to work with certain people and certain egos, and and it, you know it, it's 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 in a it, you just never know how things would ever turn out. You know, um, I, I think I think um, Nate uh, Vasquez has done you know a, a good job in terms of keeping him controlled in the corner, and I don't think he should necessarily look to to change that. Um, You've got to build momentum with with the trainer, and I think over time, um, you know those two those two could be a great fit. Um, I, I, what I would say though is, is don't ne don't neglect your conditioning because he is always going to win fights on his conditioning, and you're in against a 
a, a guy in James DeGale that, that was just wasn't able to, to fire back and the top guys will. So you need to <clears throat> always be able to outwork them because he's a nutritional fighter. We also saw, I don't know if it was his debut, but we saw George Groves do punditry. Um, obviously, George, somebody you know very, very well. I haven't seen it, so because obviously I was there. Um, what did you make of George's punditry? Brilliant. I thought he was, he was, he was brilliant. He articulated himself very well. He got in a couple of snidey little digs, but didn't look too malicious doing so. Uh, held himself very well and, and just nailed it, I thought. You know, um, I didn't see any of the, the fights before. Um, I just watched uh, the, the end of the, the jo Joyce fight and then the, um, the, the, main, uh, the main event. So, but from what I saw, I thought he did brilliantly and uh, so did Duke McKenzie as well. So, the two, one thing I was a little bit annoyed about Duke for saying is that you know, he looks vastly improved since the, the Grove, uh, Eubank Jr. looked vastly improved since the, since the Grove's performance. I thought that was a little bit um, derogatory towards uh, George because you know, we all know that, that, that George Grove's you know, would uh, would have done that same thing to him again that night because George is uh, George was was the more intelligent, more sharper fighter on the, on the, that night, and I think his style would have always been able to do that with Eubank Jr. Don't know if you've spoken to George since. I'm assuming you have. Any part of him that looks at Eubank Jr. too? Any part of him that looks at Junior? Eubank Jr. A rematch? Not at all. Um, you know, I think he's very content with his uh, decision to you know to to pack it in. So. Um, and you know when you're good at punditry, when you've got a, a great mindset for, for boxing, and you can pass on the knowledge, he's doing the right thing. You know he's packed it in. Um, as he said at the at the top, um, anything now he'll be trying to chase his, his former self, and um, he's yeah he's, he's 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 happy and content with his decision. And you know he um, he has a lot of information that he can pass down to these people, and and uh, you know he, he needs to stay involved in the sport but not get the bug back. Just finally, um, where does this leave James DeGale? In your opinion, will he likely head into retirement? I think he should. Um, you know, I don't have the needle with James DeGale that, that George does or anything like that. I look at it from, from a purely boxing perspective. And, you know, you've won Olympic gold medal. You, you've won national titles as an amateur, um, international tournaments. You've turned pro. You've, you've won British Commonwealth world titles. You've beat, you know, you beat some top fighters out there. Try to unify the division. Um, he's done it all in the sport, and he needs to just reflect on that and be happy with it and, and pack it in. You know, he's a guy that that lives for the limelight a little bit, and that could be his nemesis. But you know, we've all seen people like David Hay, who has the same sort of um, uh, mindset. You know, that they start chasing it, and then they're they're never never the same as what they were. So you've got to learn to pack it in at, at the right time and um, go out at the top. Okay, well, Shane McGuigan, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. I'll catch up with you soon. Cheers, Rob. Appreciate it. Good, mate.